Well, hello, Judy, Catherine, Nicole, Steve and David. Welcome to you all. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for the 2020 Victorian Sport Awards. It's great to have you such a, an illustrious panel. Catherine, um, we'll get straight into it and we'll start with you, given that we've just wrapped up the Paralympics and the Olympic Games of Tokyo and, ooh, and Olympics without a crowd. Could you ever have imagined that happening? Absolutely not. I don't think anyone could have seen this current COVID world as a foreseeable option. <laughs> Um, certainly not back in my day, you know, at the 92, 96 and 2000 games, absolutely not. Um, I absolutely applaud everybody who made those games, both Olympics and uh, Paralympics. You made it happen. Bravo. And you, you've often said publicly that you felt the crowd of Sydney 2000 lift you as you ran around the track. Do you think having no crowd would have affected you affected you at all positively or negatively yeah I've been thought about that when I you know each time I saw <clears throat> excuse me a, a, a final um commence actually um and I kind of uh thought to myself that athletes in a most truest nature were always always going to kind of bubble up and carry them into the performance that they're so determined to achieve um, I mean, I've often thought about the difference between those who perform well and those who don't, often the ones who don't get too attached to those on the peripheral, like you are in the audience. I think it's all about how you feel within yourself and in the inner world versus kind of the outer world. But certainly it's hard to ignore the energy from out of people's hearts and minds <laughs> in capacity stadiums, um, but certainly you do have to be quite driven and very determined, which is always a trait of performance setup that's always there regardless yeah. of who's watching and who's not. Yeah. Mona, what about for you? We saw the, there was a little bit of a crowd lining the streets of Sapporo for the, for the Olympic marathon, and, but you know, for you, would it have affected your performance in any way? Well, probably I think in the marathon, you know, you're out there for so long, it's really difficult to concentrate for, you know, two plus hours. So you need to sort of be taking in the, the surrounds and using that in a positive way. It's really how you deal with it. I think, you know, it, it's there and you want to use it in a positive way. And obviously we saw and Catherine spoke about, you know, having that energy and it, the energy can be a positive or a negative energy. And, you know, I think for the marathon runners being out there so long, having a crowd would be good because you feel like, you know, you feel like it's a, a human event, the marathon, and it's very much, you know, against the distance itself. So having the other competitors as your friends sometimes in the marathon, we have great camaraderie and having those support people on the side even though you don't know them personally which is kind of good because you're not really directly associating with them but you're having the the distraction of being able to use the positive energy and then again as Catherine says you know you're sort of looking internally and going how am I traveling oh I better start concentrating again and focusing on the race so it's um it's the way you use it in a, in that positive environment if you can I think tip it's really important yeah Judy let's switch for a minute congratulations to you on, on being inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. What an incredible career you've had. I think we all give you a round of applause. Thanks, Tiff. And everyone Thank at home watching, no doubt, is doing the same. In fact, Judy, um, you were part of the, the breakaway Virginia Slam circuit with Billie Jean King and, and seven other ladies where you were paid $1 for your service. And I believe you are the only one of that original nine that still has the dollar and you Correct. have it with you. Can we I see have. It? I have. There you go. Oh. Well, wow. That is amazing. I'm surprised that uh, any, no museums around the world have snatched that up from you yet. Have you, have, have, has there been a request? Uh, no, the WTA have wanted it a few times and I've, I've sort of lent it to them with great, um, what's the right word, uh, regarding it really well. But so, so I put it into a, um, into a you know, 
thing. So, because it's the only way to keep it. But I'm surprised that, um, you know, that none of the others kept them at all. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm, I, and they all said to me, oh, of course, you're such a hoarder. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they bought a packet of lollies. You never know back then. It would have bought you a lot. <laughs> that's about all we could have bought. I <laughs> so the Virginia Slam circuit, that ended up essentially becoming the WTA tour. Mm. Can you take us through how you came to be a part of that illustrious nine and and what the experience was like for you oh well it happened at the us open um in that um uh the pacific southwest which was the second sort of most prestigious tournament in the states after the us open was run by perry jones and jack kramer and jack kramer i don't know whether you saw the film the battle of the sexes but in it, who is portrayed as an absolute um, anti-feminist, and it was he was just terrible, and he didn't want us to be part of it. And our prize money was going to be eight hundred dollars, and the men were something like seven and a half thousand dollars. And there was going to be eight of the top ten women in the world were going to play in it. And so we went to him and said, "Look, you know, this is really unfair. Um, what are you going to do about it?" And he said, "Nothing." So we decided that we would try and do something. So we got a petition and uh, had a questionnaire um, because it was still at Forest Hills; it wasn't at Flushing Meadow. And um, we put down a questionnaire and asked different questions and said to all the people that came in, "Would they please answer it?" And the one thing that probably cha changed us and really convinced us to go ahead was that something like 45% of the men that answered the question said that they would be they would prefer to watch women's tennis more than men because they could associate the game with it rather than the men's game. And so we felt that if that was the case, we would certainly get support from the women. And if that many percentage of the men was, you know, we would do it. So after um, the US, we went to, um, to Houston, to um, Gladys Hellman's place, who, who really was the organizer of it all. And, um, on the Friday night, I think it was, we had a meeting and we all decided that she said, we can't pay you anything. And we, Billy said, well, how about a dollar? So we all said, yes, fine. So there was nine of us who were prepared to do it. None of the others were prepared to do it. Like Margaret wasn't, Virginia Wade, all those, um, Ann Jones. And um, so the nine of us signed up and, um, but we never saw, thought or saw that we would make history like we did and what and how, what we would achieve you know and it was hard work because we took a chance um you know they they we were with Kerry Melvin and I who, were, who was the other Australian um we were suspended by the Australian Association weren't allowed to play here um and it was the prospect that none of us would ever be able to play in any Grand Slam again but the ITF stepped in and said no 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 that wasn't fair and so they let us play so Basically, in a nutshell, that's what it is. But it's much longer than that. But that's really what happened. And it's thank you to to you and to the others who uh, yeah. who did that. That we have equality in uh, in pay or prize money for mm. for tennis. And uh, yeah. it's incredible what you've done. So you know, thank you so much for for all of those steps that you took. Um, yeah. but Nicole, I have to bring you on in on the back of that. It, from you know the paving the way that Judy has done, and we've seen so many ladies uh, across a, across a variety of different sports. But um, you know it's such a difficult uh, job, no doubt. What you're doing with the AFLW, and you've been there from the get go. What's been the hardest component of um, building th this football competition for women across Australia? Um, I guess one of the hardest things is the expectation that comes with it, um, mm -hmm. the expectation that, you know, it will look exactly the same as men's football that's been around for 160 years. Um, we're coming into our sixth season and we're exceptionally proud of where we've got to in such a short period of time um, with now 420 women on con contracts with AFL clubs around the nation. And, um, you know, within another 12 months, we'll be at 540 women. Um, so it is quite, um, quite terrific, tremendous and enormous what we're doing. Um, but of course, it does take time to build it. It takes time to make it commercially viable as well. Um, and, you know, even in reflecting, um, and I know Paco's um, a big one for that holistic lifestyle and education as well, even in looking at how we build, build something new from the ground up and making sure that we're actually looking at it holistically so that we have um, players and athletes out the other end of sport 
having meaningful um, lives that are ready to go and not only ready to go, but they're running parallel to, to doing sport. It's something that I did, something that Catherine and I did together with Australia Post at the time when we were competing. Um, you know, we always had a mind on what was it going to be like after sport? Let's be the best we can as an athlete, but let's have an eye on being holistic about it as well. So um, that's something that we've been trying to also um, institute and, and provide um, but the big goal for me, Tiff, is to try to um, bridge the gap. Women have been here forever, um, always punching well above our weight, particularly Australian sports women, mm -hmm. uh, and performing on the international stage. Um, but there's this gap, the gap between um, the value, the visibility of women's sports. So how can we actually bridge that gap? And I think if there's a sport that can do it without sounding arrogant, it's the AFL. You know, it's the might of the AFL in behind women's football that's really um, focused on uh, making women's sport and, and women's football more visible and more valuable. When you talk about that, that next transition post-sport, one of the um, more, more obvious jobs that sports people step into, especially footballers, or they would like, aspire to, is coaching. And that's one area that's, you know, that's received a lot of criticism, um, especially of late, that the, the lack of female coaches, not only in the AFLW, but certainly across the board in the AFL, uh, Lisa Alexander, international, mm -hmm. you know, Australian netball, former Australian netball coach, has come out and slammed the AFL saying it's a closed door for women um, after putting her hand up for a few of the jobs. And, and even in the AFLW, Beck Goddard, great to see her back in the fold at Hawthorne, but on the flip side, Peter Searle exits St Kilda um, for someone who's far less experienced. How do we continue to um, create these pathways rather than just give them you know, opportunities to, to train as a coach or to, to study, but how do we break that, that mould of you know, selecting the male over the female? Yeah, it, it's a difficult one because it comes at the same time when an industry has actually, um, you know, lost 30% of its staff uh, across, right across the board. So um, men's football, women's football. Um, so from our perspective, we are trying to do our best to change attitudes and culture and to even just think about um, the diversity. And diversity doesn't mean that it's a, a man with more hair, less hair um, in a football club. It, it's actually truly speaking to diversity from a gender perspective and, and a cultural perspective or um, a multicultural perspective. Um, the, the biggest thing is that for an athlete and, you know, I had ma mainly male coaches, but I also had female support staff around me to actually only have one type of voice that's trying to have an athlete be the best they can doesn't actually cater for the styles of learning, the styles of interaction that even male athletes would like to receive. So um, it's busting the myth that it needs to be a man that looks the same um, to be able to get the best out of an athlete. Uh, we have a multitude of programs to try to um, develop women in football from coaching to umpiring, even the players. But unless we can actually get um, men on this journey to actually understand that having a woman in a football department won't lose you a Premiership Cup, it may even win you a Premiership Cup. So they're the changes that we're trying to institute. Yeah. I know, David, there's a perfect segue into bringing you in. You have been, um, you're well recognised as being way ahead of your time as a coach um, throughout your entire, what was it, I wrote 518 games. Um, and one of the things you were really um, strong about early in the day was a woman could come into the AFL system and coach. And Joyce Brown was a colleague of yours um, in the age education sector and, and former Australian netball um, coach as well. Do you think that a woman will ever coach at the AFL in a senior role? Because we've seen Peter Sell in an assistant role, but will that ever happen? I'm sure it will, Tiff. In fact, um, I shared an office with Joyce Brown, which was an, an interesting- uh, Yeah, it was. Yeah, an interesting <laughs> experience in itself. But I have absolutely no doubt, none at all, and I'm saying it because people would think I should say it, but Joyce was an outstanding coach, full stop. Mm. And had she uh, been given the opportunity, I talked at one stage about becoming my assistant at the uh, Carlton Football Club. And I think the only reason she said no was that her son was on the list and was one of the players. Mm. And I think had she said yes, it would have been breaking ground in a very positive way. Now, I have no doubt 
she would have been able to contribute as expected in that particular role. So it's a slow grind, as, you, as you're pointing out, Tip. It's, it's not easy. I think women have done it tough in almost every sport and the coaches have done it tougher within that sport. But I think there's an education process pretty consistently going on across the board now. And, uh, you know, Nicole's fighting the, the battle very obviously. I, you know, I noticed the other day that there are three presidents, I think, of the current AFL clubs mm. in the um, finals. There were three female presidents yeah, who is- are doing an incredibly good job. So it's that kind of historical development which is going to, I think, it is slow and I'm embarrassed by it. A lot of other people are, but it will happen. Tiff, the NFL's done a really great job yes. with um, bringing women into these traditional football roles. Mm-hmm. It's a sport that in America that do- obviously doesn't have um, as much of a female gridiron American mm-hmm. football presence, mm-hmm. but um, they actually went about it really well. They started to run this um, women in football seminar. They did it at the time that the combine was on, that all the men coaches were in, in town, and they actually went and found their five or six mm-hmm. senior male coaches um, at the big franchises. Uh, to become the champions and suddenly it became infectious you know who has a woman in the football department oh well, if they've got it we want that too yes. uh, and these amazing women are stepping into roles like never before you know assistant coaches referees head of strength and conditioning you know they are you know really infiltrating yeah. nfl so yeah. i think we can learn from that as well we need some of the if we're looking at afl or nrl we need some of the senior coaches to actually stick their hand up and say I actually want to be part of this change because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, and we we certainly saw that at, at the last uh, the Super Bowl this year, which had women in the assistant roles. Going back to you, David. I think, uh, Kip, yeah, sorry, Kip, I think, and you know, and 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 so those presidents at AFL clubs, also, you know, Patria Thomas will be chef commissioner of the Commonwealth yep. Games team next year. So we are getting them in leadership positions and the sports commission's developing a lot of leadership roles. It's just trying to infiltrate the sort of the last bastion will be that kind of coaching environment. But we are we are making uh, making inroads, I think, and we need to keep pushing that. Now that you're well, look, sorry, sorry, Tiff. Look what um, Andy Murray did with the Miller Maresmo. Yes. I mean, everybody mm. thought he was crazy, but you know, he'd been so guided by his mother um, that he didn't think anything of it. You know, and he was quite criticised for for doing it. And she turned out to be so good for him. It was terrific. I think the the glaring. Um, topic in the room is obviously COVID. It's been so fabulous that for 20 minutes we haven't even mentioned it, but obviously <laughs> it's impacted us and we're, we're host, hosting this panel online. Um, going going to you, Judy, seeing you just had the, the floor just like previous. Right. We've just had the, the US Open um, and in the men's was not, not so much predictable, but it was sort of, you know, we had obviously two finalists that um, we've, we've certainly are well known, but in the women's was incredible to see two teenagers um, and and for the first time a qualifier win the, the US Open or win a, a Grand Slam. Unbelievable. Um, do you think COVID has had an impact in, I suppose, um, making it a lot more open and equal in the women's draw? I think it. I think it would made it difficult for a lot of them. Um, certainly for Ash, it was extremely difficult. She was probably um, of all of the top players the one most affected because she had to stay away from home for so long. Um, at least the others who lived in Europe or America could sort of travel freely. But you know, the girl who won it, Emma, um, she's amazing because she wasn't able to play a single tournament for 15 months because of her ranking was so low and they didn't have any challenger tournaments. So she basically had nothing. And then, you know, she had so much promise and then she went to Wimbledon and, you know, got to the, to the last or the Saturday of Wimbledon and, um, and then she got onto the centre court, never been on the centre court before. Um, and it was all just too much for her and she got terrible stress and she got these terrible stomach cramps and had to forfeit. Um, but from, from then on, she's been fantastic and she's, you know, I, I wasn't surprised, um, but still it was a phenomenal record to play 10 matches and not lose a, a set. It was it's just amazing. Um, but, and she would have been affected by it as well. I'm sure a lot of them. I think I think that's probably why the results were strange. Maybe more in the women than in the men's. And what about um, 
COVID for you, Catherine, in terms of consuming sport and watching it. Is there anything that um, that you have seen implemented over the past 18 months that you think has been a positive um, that we've had to adjust to? Well, I only have to walk out the front of my home here and it's just really lovely seeing so many walkers, runners, people on bikes, kids, you know, it's, it's actually lovely. I think for me that's probably the most, I guess touching aspect is that people are kind of, yeah, revisiting the the touch point that is the benefits of activity and and you know motion and, and movement. It's um I think it's been a bit of a forgotten art. I think you know mm. if you can call it art. Mm. Um, but it's almost like a, it's a beautiful scene to see so much activity out on the footpaths or you know Bayside here in Melbourne that it's buzzing with um, activity in a really healthy wholesome way no doubt you see I, that I think it's Mona. been terrific Tiff oh yeah. yeah I'm booking a lane at Lake Wendere my no, track gonna... and I can't get on it it's unbelievable. <laughs> that was my next I, question I'm... exactly that <laughs> and it's great to see so many people understanding the value of exercise and you know it's great that we've been able to do it but almost rediscovering it and sharing and it's almost become the social you know you don't have to touch a person you can just eye contact and just that respect of of seeing everybody out and acknowledging people exercising it and now you know it is it's big sport we're talking about you know the awards and celebrating the successes we need to you know make sure the community values sport but also converting the people who are exercising into the, the clubs and so having that system through. So we get the people, we saw such fantastic performances and the humility of our performances at the Olympics and Paralympics and at the US Open that we're talking about. It all starts at that grassroots. And you know we should celebrate the people who are recognizing tonight, our volunteers, our clubs, but we also need to make sure that we, you know, we maximise the impact. We can be take the positives out of COVID and, and exercise and seeing the community out, um, enjoying the environment has just been fantastic. And puts a smile. I can see we're all smiling because we all understand this has been one of the great positives of COVID, and we need to now be able to sort of transition that to get this new generation, get people realising that it's exercise for life. Yeah, and we've heard some great initiatives already through tonight's award winners. We'll stick with you, Mona, on the the um, the topic of, um, of I suppose climate change or you know or the changing of heat, or the increasing heat in the in the atmosphere. We we heard about um, Tokyo being they've they've taken on a sustainability um, you know strategy and being a lot more a lot greener those games. But they were the hottest games on record. So in terms of events that we see, we've got the marathon, we've got the walk, um, we've got a lot of events that are out in the heat of the day. Can you really see um, sports globally, not just the Olympics, but having to adjust and change because of, um, you know, because of what we're seeing from an environmental perspective? Yeah, I think we've talked about change with Judy and, and David and, and Nicole and Kathy tonight even. And I think, you know, athletes are the ones who will, who will make the change. And it's interesting, you know, we say that the organisation in the IOC and, and the CGF have changed the way that um, games are run. It'll be the athletes speaking that will change. You know, my coach, I remember Chris Wardlaw saying, we should have the um, Olympic marathon at the Winter Olympics because the temperature's a lot better. You know, so it will be athletes' voice. And we saw how the marathons will move to Sapporo. And, and, you know, I think what will happen is there will be athletes. And we noticed a lot more focus on athletes this time and their commentary. And certainly at the Paralympics, their, you know, their personalities came out. They will become spokespeople for, for environmental issues. And, and we will be using sport to change things. And... And I, I'm sensing that there's just a bit of a groundswell and, um, you know, the, the environment will benefit from, we as a human race will benefit. And that's where sport does, you know, have such an impact on the world. And we've seen that through COVID. We all enjoyed watching and following our sports people. So we have the environment now for change coming from um, our sports people. And I, I think there's a groundswell that's going to happen. It's an yeah. underground movement that's going to suddenly bottle up and, um, you know, for a positive change for the environment. We need it and it's, yeah. it's going to happen. We're seeing the youth do it and that's obviously going to translate through to sporting events. 
David, I'm going to again switch topics and come back to you. Um, some people may not know that you're on the, I think, the selection committee for the new coach of Carlton. There's a big job in front of you. And um, I mentioned before, you've had over 500 games coaching. And there was a great story um, that I've heard before, but I'd love you to share when you're a bit of a rebel like Judy in your own right in terms of um, uh, jumping ship from Hawthorne to Carlton. Obviously, it happens across the AFL, but can you take us back to that infamous night after spending 20 years at Hawthorne where you captained a premiership and then you coached them um, to a, a premiership where you uh, found yourself suddenly in, a, in the opposition camp and, uh, and at the Blues and, and here you are now considered one of the, the greatest of all time? Well, that's very nice, Tiff. Um, it's very true. Well I'm, well, I'm back actually. I'm back here sitting in, in, in a table at the uh, Carlton Football Club right now because I've been was given the responsibility of trying to find the uh, the next coach. As I was sacked, um, somebody arrived at my front door about one o'clock in the morning. I think he was the board member at the uh, Hawthorne Football Club. I thought I was going all right. We won a premiership the year before and uh, <laughs> I thought I was still a wanted commodity, but uh, he came to warn me that the board had just made a decision to um, talk to a number of other, other people as replacements, one of them being the great Peter Hudson. So I thought on that basis, I probably wasn't wanted and resigned, went down and left my, um, which mind you was uh, accepted very, very quickly. So I actually did the right thing. But within a within a week, it was very nice to have a, um, a uh, well, a talk to the Carlton Football Club and the, the rest is history. How lucky I was, Hawthorne struggled for a while and I walked into the best team probably, that uh, this club's ever had at one, two out of three years or whatever, and then I was lucky enough to take them on. So you can be fortunate in your career. A lot of people work exceptionally hard, and the panel tonight is just an exceptional array of great. I'm just feeling really <laughs> nervous here about these exceptional people who have done wonderful things in their sport and are recognised as leaders now and have continued to give and I think that's a lovely thing I mean I remain great mates with Steve Monaghetti and Steve is an incredibly um, good man in the in good man in the in the right uh, sense of the term and uh, has continued as the others on on the panel have continued to try and improve the environment which our athletes work at work and I I'm one that as you know, in the, in, the, in the balanced lifestyle that we've talked about, get terribly upset. The AFL have done the research to show that an, a, a footballer, in this case, who does do some study, does some work placement, works in a community program, does song and dance if he's Shane Crawford, um, pe person who is actually doing something else during their career, if that's possible, and I see Judy there, you know, thinking, how can tennis players do anything else but travel and play but we've proven AFL research has proven that the player who does get committed in a sincere way to something else other than his football during his career in fact has a better performance mm. career it's absolutely proven by the research what we haven't done and we should and when the money becomes available again the AFL research board will look to see those who have prepared for life after do make the transition in a productive way. We don't have that research. I believe deep down it's absolutely conclusive already, but we need to have the research to say so that clubs in AFL, I obviously know a little bit more about, will in fact set up uh, an environment and a culture that allows players to be the best as footballers, that's what they're there for, but at the same time, develop themselves for life during and particularly afterwards. And we won't have the problems that I almost see on a daily basis for those who are unprepared for life after. And um, Tiff, I reckon that, yes. that needs to be coach-driven as well. And I think we've got there with Olympic sport where coaches 
um, through the programming, the great programming at the AIS and the, um, you know, mental health and wellbeing leads in most of the national sporting organisations now that the coaches have now bought into, you don't have to be fully focused on, you know, your own sport 24-7 to be good at sport. In fact, it probably has a detrimental effect. So um, if we're thinking about the football codes and those professional sporting codes, you know, it needs to be coach driven that they don't have to have access to the players seven days a week. Um, you know, training every single moment of every single day to be a good athlete. In fact, it's it's detrimental. It's worth me saying to you that we've actually just launched TIFF Workplay, um, which is a new uh, platform. At the moment, it's for AFLW players, but we do have plans to expand it out to female athletes, which is actually looking at um, matching um, female athletes with employers, um, similar cast to what we used to do with Olympic job opportunity, um, that, that are actually supportive of their dual pathway, supportive of their want to have vocational um, uh, aspiration as well. So workplay.com.au is where it is. So businesses that want to get involved to support female athletes. Uh, and then we're, we're branching out once we get the AFLW players sorted, we'll branch out to other female athletes as well. Fantastic. That's well done. Great. Right. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, and you know what, Nick, you, you answered my next question. So uh, thank you. <laughs> so the last question, as I look at the time, I could sit here and talk to you, all of you for hours, but um, let's go back to the Olympics and the Paralympics. If I could ask each of you to give me one highlight um, from either of them, uh, you know, that you can share with us. And let's start with you, Judy, you're at the top of my screen. Well, I have to say, Dylan, oh, God, I, mean, I just think that the match that he played against the... Um, the guy from the Netherlands in the semi-final of the singles was just the most phenomenal match. And I think um, you could see the emotions from the two of them um, when it was finished. I mean, they were both in tears and it was just, and I think what he achieved this year is just the most phenomenal thing. I mean, it's just incredible. Nobody, will, well, I'll say nobody will ever do it, but certainly not in my lifetime. I just can't imagine anybody doing it. So for me, that was the highlight. I mean, obviously it was because it was in my, the sport that I'm, involved in but even so I just thought it was phenomenal the golden slam as you said and I yep. think you said earlier only Steffi Graf has done it yep uh, that's yeah. correct yeah yep. Catherine your highlight oh there were a few tiff but uh for me right now what comes to mind is uh, our first gold medal in the men's decathlon mm. um Ash Maloney and Cedric D Dubler and the way that Dubler kind of you know really encouraged yeah, mate, that was, I thought that was really cool, actually. Very heartwarming. It, it had um, a throwback, I suppose, to 1956 when we had. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was pretty amazing. Um, what about for you, David? Oh, uh, I just taken, Cass just taken mine. I, I, that, I actually, <laughs> I actually broke down. I'm a bit of a hard man, but I actually broke down and had a cry when I saw two athletes working together mm. in, in the Catholic to get one by, and he would, there's no doubt that it wasn't for the influence of his mate, he would never have achieved what he achieved. And I think that highlighted what, you know, ath athletics or sport has the capacity to do. So that was a moment that really reduced me to shambles. Beautiful. What about for you, Mona? Actually, for me, it was Jess Fox, because I think, you know, overcoming mm -hmm. the adversity, you know, I think we're all sort of, you know, thinking, wow, is she going to get that gold medal? And then when she did, and for her to then be able to gather again and come back and, and win the gold medal, ultimately, that she searched for for so long, was that Australian spirit of, you know, when you're down and you've had a bit of a, a setback, you still, you you turn it around and fight back. And, and then Patrick Tin and on the track, being distance run, you know, for him to collapse and you talk about the conditions it was obviously um you know the humidity it was a cauldron out there for him to be going through that having the race of his life collapsing still getting up and finishing mm. the Australian spirit it's not about the medals it's about representing your country to the best of your ability in, in adversity and he certainly showed that was was phenomenal so but uh, and the way just the, the whole the way the athletes embraced you know, sorry to talk so long, Tiff, but, you know, they had an extra year, the anxiety that I saw athletes going through to then be able to get to Tokyo and perform in both the Olympics and the Paralympics as well as they did representing their country. I was worried that they may not have had a positive experience, but as it turns out, they've, you know, come back through quarantine and now we're seeing what great role models and great experience they had. And congratulations to every single one of them who represented Australia at, at, at such a, with such um, great 
humility and mm. um, to be proud of them. And for you, Thanks, Nick, Nick, as our final and a three-time Olympian. Have time for me now that Monas is so long? It, Sorry. It's a marathon, <laughs> Monas, it's a sprint. <laughs> um, you know I'm going to say the swimming team. Um, you know, to see the women perform the way that they did um, at the Olympic Games was, I got to go, I got to commentate on it, um, was incredible. Emma McKeon, um, Ariane Titmus, uh, Kaylee McEwen, who all won individual multiple gold medals, but um, the women's relays, the four by one medley, four by one free. Um, shout out to the aquatic family, because unlike you dry land athletes, it's been bloody difficult during COVID. Mm. Um, so um, they've had to find unique ways. Cole Pierce, one of our Paralympians, swimming in his family's dam. They've had mm. to find unique ways to stay in the water. So well done to the aquatics family uh, and well done to our women over in Tokyo. Yeah, and well done to you on brilliant commentary. Loved every second <laughs> of it. Well, thank you to all of you, Nick, Mona, Dave, um, Catherine and Judy uh, for sharing your thoughts and your experiences and and as I said we could continue for hours but uh, we do have to close really appreciate your time and you're all legends of Victorian sport and we appreciate not only your time now but everything you've done for Victorian sport well Thanks done to you too, Tiff. congratulations everyone tonight yeah. pleasure working with your team everyone look after yourself <laughs> yes. yes you all take care thank you bye everyone take care guys bye now